Perfect. Well, please uh, turn with me to the passage that we read in John chapter 18, if you're able to do so. Now, how far would you go to protect the one you love? The salvation of a Christian, a believer, is a glorious fact. It means forgiveness of sins, a new heart and a new life, a home in heaven. And the Bible is very clear that this salvation comes to us as a free gift of God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's why it's by grace, because it's a free gift. Ephesians 2 tells us, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But as great and as glorious as this salvation is, the question arises and sometimes troubles Christian people, some Christian people greatly. If I have been saved, can I lose that salvation? Will Satan get the better of me? Will sin and temptation overcome me? Or will I just grow cold and walk away? Now, the answer of the Bible to that question is, see how far the Lord Jesus Christ has gone to protect you. Because what the Bible tells us is that Christians persevere right to the end until the Lord takes them home to heaven. And the reason they do that is because the Lord Jesus Christ preserves us. He keeps us believing and keeps us trusting him, despite the ups and downs and the pitfalls and the problems. But that great truth, we persevere because he preserves us. It's rooted in the great victory that he has won over all our enemies. And that's what's pictured for us in John chapter 18. How far would you go to protect the one you love? Well, we need to see how far the Lord Jesus Christ went to protect the ones that he loves. Now, before we get to that, just three points to make, okay? The first one is, when we talk about persevering, we have to recognize that not everybody who professes to be a Christian is really a Christian. We see that in the parable of the sower. Not all the places where the good seed falls bears fruit. But we also see it in John 18, in the, par in the example of Judas Iscariot. And people who claim to be Christians, or think they're Christians but aren't really, well, they, of course, can fall away because their faith isn't real saving faith. Real saving faith is a trust in Christ alone for salvation, and that means salvation from sin, not just an interest in the gospel or a desire to have some blessings from God, but to leave our sin untouched. You see, lots of people receive blessings from God, even in answer to prayer. But real salvation never rests satisfied with blessings. Real salvation is concerned to know that we've been delivered from the guilt of sin and forgiven. We've been delivered from the power of sin and set free. And we've been delivered from the love of sin so that we might love God and love our neighbour as we should. You see, real faith is always mingled with repentance. And we trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour and as Lord. So that's the first thing. Not everybody who professes to be a Christian is a Christian. The second thing is this. When we talk about perseverance, we don't mean everything is a bed of roses. Because in the Christian life, there can be very deep waters. Christians can be attacked and persecuted, tempted and subject to doubts. They can sin and they can backslide and grow cold. Because the Christian life is a life in conflict with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Those three big enemies. And we are never out of conflict until we leave this world and go home to be with the Saviour in glory. Now just before this passage, in John chapter 17, we have the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ for his people before he goes to the cross. And he tells us in verses 14 and 15, he's praying to the Father, and he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. 
because they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. I don't pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. You see, there's going to be problems and persecution and difficulties and battles. But the Lord's will for us is not that we are just converted and taken straight home to heaven, but that we serve him in the world with that great assurance that while we are serving him in the world, we wouldn't be overcome by the devil, but we would be kept, kept safe, and ultimately brought home to glory. So, real Christians can go through deep waters. But, thirdly, all real Christians do persevere. Two things to say here. Number one, we know this because the Saviour promised it. John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. He promises it, and we can have confidence in that. He'll keep us. But as well as that, the Saviour prayed for it. Chapter 17 again, verses 23 and 24. He talks about I in them, that's himself in believers, and you in me, the Father in him, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you've sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you've given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. What he's saying there is, he's praying that every believer's union and fellowship with God won't be broken. And that then at the end of our lives, we might go home to heaven and behold his glory. He prays for it. And we know that everything he asked of the Father was always granted. The Father loved the Son and he refused him nothing. So that's the big picture. Not everyone who professes to be a Christian is a Christian. The Christian life means we can go through deep waters, but we have both the promise and the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ to assure us that all real Christians will persevere right to the end because the Lord will keep his people. In John chapter 18, we are taken back behind the scenes of those promises and those prayers. And what we are confronted with is this. On what basis can we be sure that the Lord Jesus Christ will keep his promise? On what basis does he preserve his people and deliver them from all their enemies? And the answer we get is this. Not only has the Saviour promised it, and prayed for it but he has secured it by overcoming all our enemies that's what's happening in this section of john chapter 18 and so the question comes to us again if we want confidence that the lord will keep us and that he'll never let us go and that we'll never be overcome we look to this passage and to other places in scripture and we see how far the Lord has gone to protect us. The context of John 18 is very well known. The Lord Jesus comes out of the Garden of Gethsemane, in verse 1, with his disciples. It's a dark Thursday night, and they're met by a band of armed men with torches. And it's Judas, the betrayer, leading them with a group of Roman soldiers and the Jewish temple guard. And you see there these combined forces of politics, of greed, and of graceless religion coming to oppose the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples with force. And it's a picture, you see. There are enemies that come against us. How in that situation, when they come against us strong and armed, are we able to resist them and to stand? Well, we look 
to the Lord Jesus Christ and see how far he went to protect us. We start in verse 4. This is verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? It's a settled commitment on the part of Christ. We told three things, aren't we? His knowledge. When he comes out to the Garden of Gethsemane and meets this group of armed men, he's not taken by surprise. Neither is he unaware of where it's all going to lead. The arrest, the trial, the mistreatment, the cross. He knew all things that would come upon him. Now this is evident from his ministry. We're told in Mark chapter 10 that he said to his disciples a long time before this, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they'll condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they'll mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day, he'll rise again. Just before this happening, when the Saviour was in the garden, it's recorded in Luke 22 that he prayed as there was this dawning realisation of what this actually was going to mean for him. He prayed, Father, if it's your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And after that wrestling in prayer to the Father, that he might submit himself to the Father's will, and that he might go forward in confidence, depending on the Lord to help him, he comes out of the garden fully prepared to go forward and drink the cup. He knew what was going to happen. Second thing is his knowledge. Knowing what was going to happen, he went forward. Now, there are many previous times in the Gospels when things could have come to a head like this, but the Lord avoided it. There are occasions where he healed people and told them not to make it public. Don't tell anyone, he says. There's an instance in John chapter 6, when after the feeding of the 5,000, the crowd want to take him and make him king by force. But the Lord Jesus avoided that. The reason was the time wasn't right for things to come to a head. But now, the time is right. And when that time has come, we don't see the Lord Jesus Christ as an unwilling victim or somebody who shies away or buckles at the last moment in the face of the conflict. Rather, knowing it all, he went forward and he engaged with his enemies. And then we have the third thing, his words. Having gone forward, he said, whom are you seeking? And they answer him, verse 5, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. No hiding away, no prevarication. He himself brings things to a head and he focuses all the attention of this band of armed men on himself. Who are you seeking, Jesus? I am he. In the full knowledge of what this would mean, arrest, mistreatment, crucifixion and death, the Lord Jesus Christ steps forward. So just pause a minute and think, how far the Lord Jesus Christ went so that he might protect his own? But there's more to this question than just a bare means of identifying himself, you know? Jesus is asking them if they really know who he is, who's about to drink the cup that the Father has given him. And the reason I say that is because three times in this passage, in verses 5, 6 and 8, you have the phrase, I am. What are we to make of that? Well, 
verses 5 and 6 is where this occurs first. And in verses 5 to 6, what we are presented with is the irresistible power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he, or simply, I am. And when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. They are overwhelmed. Now what's happening here is that this is a revelation of divine glory and irresistible power. Because I am he is just two words, two Greek words, I am. And it can be used in a variety of ways, you know. Sometimes it's just a simple confirmation, are you Jesus? Yes, I am. But there's a deeper significance in those words in the scripture. And that explains what's going on here. Why do they draw back and fall to the ground? These are hardened soldiers. And they've got force of numbers and weapons on their side. They are not overawed by a man who just happens to be confident. The reality is that I am is the name of the almighty, self-sufficient God. Back in the book of Exodus, when the Lord appeared to Moses at the burning bush, he promised to deliver Israel from their slavery in Egypt. And Moses asked his name, who shall I tell the people is sending me? And in Exodus 3 and verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. There he is, the true and living God, the Lord, self-sufficient and all-powerful, who's about to defeat his enemies and set his people free. And here's the Lord Jesus Christ faced with his enemies. And he says, I am. And they shrink back and fall to the ground. Now the Lord Jesus has used this name before. John chapter 8. Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And they knew exactly what he meant. He was claiming to be God. Because he is God. The significance of this for us, well, the one who steps forward to protect his people is Almighty God. Before him, all his enemies are overwhelmed. But the Almighty One is then taken and arrested and bound and mistreated. And put to death. He doesn't use that almighty overwhelming power to deliver himself and to punish his enemies. And the reason is it takes more than an act of divine power even to protect his people from their enemies. If he'd meant to destroy he could have done it with a word but there is something far richer and far deeper going on here. This battle, the battle to defend his people, isn't one that can be won by force. Back in 2 Kings 19, the angel of the Lord came and destroyed the army of the Assyrians. But not every battle is like that. And this battle, Preserving his people from their enemies is not a battle that can be won with force. And so the eternal, self-sufficient, all-powerful God hides his glory and takes the form of a servant. Jesus is eternal God, become man. All things were created through him. He upholds all things by the word of his power including the people who are now opposing him. And yet, he covered his glory with fragile flesh. When he walked around Galilee, he didn't look like the ready brick man with a glow about him. When people saw him in the street, they would never have recognised him as God in the flesh. He hid his glory and he hid his power, but that's who he was. The God who could easily deliver himself 
from his enemies by an act of power. But more was needed to deliver his people from their enemies. For that to happen, he had to hide his glory and become a servant. So here's something to consider. When you look to the Lord Jesus Christ, can you see how far he's gone to protect you? He's gone further than even divine power can reach. The next thing. This name, these words, I am. Well, it's a name that's despised. It would be interesting to think what the enemies thought of Jesus and thought who he was before they came to the garden. For many of the Roman soldiers, they probably didn't have much clue. It was probably just a job to them. They may have heard some stories about him, but we don't get the impression that they had a lot of interaction, really. For the Jewish temple guard and the Jews in general, it's different. They had more knowledge. But they regarded Jesus as a blasphemer, a man who claimed to be God falsely. But at the same time, they knew that he performed miracles of remarkable power and that the common people heard him gladly. But then you've got Judas. Judas knew more. Judas knew his claims, had seen his power exercised, but also experienced the true character of Christ in a relational sense. He'd lived with him. He'd seen his sinlessness and his selflessness and his compassion. And here they are, coming to the garden with their differing perceptions, but intent on one thing, to find Jesus of Nazareth and arrest him. And he meets them and he says, who are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, I am he. And suddenly they are overwhelmed by the divine glory and the divine power and they fall to the ground. And how are they going to react? Now you would think, wouldn't you, that when that happens, they would think again. And they would take stock and they would realise who he is and they would humble themselves and rather than seeking to arrest him, they would look for his forgiveness. But that doesn't happen. When they recover themselves, they press ahead and they arrest him and they bind him. Now why is that? I think we have to recognise that people are not looking for God. In fact, the Bible tells us the opposite. In Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, quote in the Old Testament, there is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, well they certainly are in John 18. Destruction and misery are in their ways. There is no fear of God before their eyes. It's a common misunderstanding that people are seeking God. They're not. They are seeking the things that only God can give. Peace, contentment, freedom from fear, joy. But they're not seeking God. They're trying to find those things without him. They're even prepared to take them from him as long as he will leave them alone. You see, it takes a work of the Spirit of God in a heart for somebody to really seek God. And without that, we find ourselves in the situation of John 18, where when we are confronted by the true and living God, we just oppose him. Think of Pharaoh in the Old Testament. Pharaoh experienced many examples and evidences of the Lord's power. And he also experienced the Lord's mercy when he asked Moses to pray that the Lord might take the plagues off the land. And he did. And when God's hand was heavy on Pharaoh, he was humbled and he asked God for mercy. But when things went back to normal, Pharaoh rebelled again 
until ultimately it led to his destruction. And that's just what we've got in John 18. When the Lord says, I am he, and they are overwhelmed, they are cast to the ground. But when they recover themselves, they continue in the same opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ as ever. Now, people want God's gifts, but without a commitment to God himself. Pharaoh wanted freedom to live his own life. Judas wanted money. The Jews wanted status, but they didn't want God. Maybe you remember the parable of the vineyard in Mark chapter 12. The vineyard owner rents the vineyard out to um, tenants. Then he sends his servants to receive the fruit from the vineyard and they mistreat the servants and send them away. And in Mark chapter 12, still having one son, his beloved, the vineyard owner sent him to them, last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But those vine dressers, the tenants, said among themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. You notice that, they want the gifts, but they don't want the God. The Lord Jesus knew this. John chapter 1 and verse 11, he came to his own, and his own didn't receive him. In place of honour and worship, which was due to him by right, he endured neglect and mockery and mistreatment. Now think of this. This is the true and living God in the flesh, the one who deserves to be honoured and praised. But what does he experience? Neglect, mockery, mistreatment. Can you see how far the Lord Jesus Christ has gone to protect you? So far as to endure the hostility of sinful men and women against himself without retaliation or self-defence. He could have destroyed them in a moment, but without retaliation and self-defence, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. The last thing, verses 7 to 12, we see here the Lord Jesus Christ as a surety, a guarantor for his people. Now the word surety isn't commonly used these days. It's a word we find in the Bible. It's not a word I've used for a long time, but I think it's worth drawing it to your attention. A surety is a guarantor, somebody who promises that something will be sure and certain. And what it means is he takes responsibility to settle someone's debts if that person defaults. And so if they default, the person who has loaned the money can go after the guarantor, the surety, that they might settle the debt. Notice verse 7. The Lord Jesus Christ asks his question a second time. Whom are you seeking? And they get the same reply, Jesus of Nazareth. And then in verse 8, he says, I have told you that I am he. I am. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. This is the pinch point, the sharp end, the real nub of it all. The Lord Jesus Christ doesn't secure the safety of his people and their perseverance to the very end by an act of divine power. The Lord Jesus Christ is prepared to take the mistreatment of sinful men against him. And when his people's enemies come against them in force, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am. If you are seeking me, let these go their way. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none, because I have become their guarantor. I will settle their debts. 
And so whatever claim you have against them, I will pay. And they are free to go. That's the basis and the heart and the root as to why Christian people persevere. It's because the Lord Jesus Christ has settled all the claims against them because of which they may be lost. We'll look at that now, but it's vitally important, you see. Why weren't the disciples arrested and killed along with their master? If their enemies have got a claim on them, the Lord Jesus Christ says, here I am. Let these go free. Now, for a person to be saved, it takes more than an act of divine power. The Lord Jesus Christ has to give himself into the power of his enemies. And he has to drink the cup that the Father has given him. It takes more than an act of divine power because the enemies of God's people are the broken law, the wrath of God, and the accusations of the devil. And they've got a point. You can't overcome them by force. They've got a point. We have broken the law and we can't unbreak the law. And the broken law demands punishment. See, they've got a point. God is angry with sinners. Not an uncontrolled rage and lashing out, but the settled holy opposition of the glorious God against everything and everyone who is unclean and rebellious. He's got a point. And the devil accuses us of sin and he's got a point. God has said the soul that sins shall die. And so the devil come and de comes and demands of God, you've said that they should die, well they must die. And he comes and says the same thing to us. You were lost and you were condemned, you must die. And those enemies, the broken law, the wrath of God and the accusing devil can't be overcome by power, that would be unjust. They have to be overcome in another way. The law must be satisfied. The cup of God's wrath must be drunk. And the accusations of the devil must be answered. And that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ standing in his people's place. Now, he did this in his life. In Galatians chapter 4, we are told God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. He was born under the law, and he kept the law that we have broken. He did that. But more has to be done. In his death, he has to bear the punishment of the broken law. And he did that when he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He delivered us from the wrath of God. He delivered us from death and hell. And he answered all of Satan's accusations. How? How can Jesus of Nazareth do that? How can he pay that debt in full for a multitude of people that are like the sand of the sea and the stars of heaven? How is that possible? Well, who are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, the man? Hold on. I am, he says. God in the flesh. I have told you that I am. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. A work of even divine power wasn't able to set his people free and answer the accusations of their enemies. So the Son of God became man so that he might be their guarantor, their surety, and he might pay our debt in full. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. What is there about his life 
one life that can serve as a ransom for many? That's the question. Well, Jeremiah 23 tells us, in his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Who is the one who stood in the place of his people and gave himself to death and bore their sins? It's the Lord, the great I am, the Son of God incarnate. And as John puts it, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. The whole point here is the salvation of his people is certain because all of their enemies have been overcome. The broken law, the wrath of God, the accusations of the devil. Because the one who has done it is not merely a man. The one who has done it is the great I am. God in the flesh. So pause a minute and see how far the Lord Jesus Christ has gone to protect you if you're a child of God today. He's gone to the cross and borne all your sins. He can do it. He's the great I am. He's died our death and he's risen again. He satisfied the wrath of God in full. And he's closed the doors of hell for his people forever. And so Christian people are safe our sins can never condemn us because Christ has died to take away our sins. Satan can never condemn us because Christ has answered all his accusations. Whatever it is that you have against them, I will answer and I will pay. Who are you seeking? I am he. Let these go their way. Whenever the devil brings an accusation to us, what do we do? We say, Jesus Christ has answered in my place. I can go my way. I can be free. Whenever sin comes to us and accuses us, what do we say? Christ has borne my sins to Calvary. He's answered in my place. I'm free to go. Whenever we fear the wrath of God, that the Father may ultimately turn against us and cast us off, what do we say? The Lord Jesus Christ was cast off by the Father. He was forsaken and he was afflicted. He was cast out in my place so that all there might be in the heart of God for me is welcome and acceptance for Christ's sake forever and ever. When we feel accused or ready to despair, the great antidote is to consider Jesus and his infinite sacrifice on our behalf you know the hymn he breaks the power of cancelled sin he sets the prisoner free his blood can make the foulest clean his blood availed for me draw near listen to the lord jesus christ i have told you that i am therefore if you the enemies of my people seek me they are surety, they are guarantor, they are saviour. Then let these go their way. Take courage. The Lord Jesus Christ is as good as his word. The Lord Jesus Christ has secured the salvation of his people at Calvary. And the Lord Jesus Christ will keep us to the very end. Nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our Lord, we are sure to persevere if the Lord has died to save us. And we can have confidence, just as he's promised, that we will behold his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, I trust this will be of some help to you in the weeks ahead.